back to the Nexus podcast. I am in Las Vegas at Black Hat a couple hours after my friend, my colleague, Noam Moshe's talk here um, about the Unitronics attack. Noam is a Team 82 researcher, and this was his second talk in as many years at Black Hat, so pretty cool. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, Team 82's research into these integrated PLC HMI devices. They were at the center of numerous attacks targeting water facilities in Israel and the U.S. Um, these attacks were made public late last year, um, and it led to uh, some interesting research, including uh, the release to open source today of a couple of forensics tools that were built by Team 82, uh, which was uh, a huge help in uh, pulling off this research. They are both freely available today on Team 82's GitHub page, and we'll link to all of that. So... What's up? Noam, how are you? Hey, Mike, how are you? Good, Fun meeting good. you in person. Yes, I think we're doing this like once a year. <laughs> yeah, once a year. <laughs> um, so congrats on the talk, man. It's a, yeah. It went well. Yeah, I always love giving talks with Black Hat. It's always a good, a good experience. So uh, let's start with the, the devices themselves and, and the attack. Um, these integrated HMI PLC devices, how common are they? Uh, so we do see some what we call two-in-one, basically an integrated PLC and an HMI. These are usually for cheaper models, uh, okay. and basically they help reduce costs. Because then you buy one device and you actually have both of them. So it's somewhat common, yep. but it's less of the big names right. that do them. And basically do they work any differently uh, so if no, they were integrated they, they work the same basically yeah. you can when you download the logic to the plc you also create the screens for the hmi so it's almost the same mm -hmm. and they some in some cases like they do, they do have the feature of being on the same system so you can integrate them even easier yeah. and you don't need to connect some kind of devices mm -hmm. but basically it's the same as having a plc and an hmi only this time it sits on the same machine right so you also program the logic for the plc and also build the screens for the hmi mm -hmm. so these the unitronics uh vision PLCs, um, they were at the the center of these attacks late last. Well, they were publicized late last year. The attacks, um, facilities here in the U.S. and in Israel were um, attacked, and these devices were devi um, defaced. Correct? Yeah, cor correctly. So, what actually happened behind the scenes is the attacker attacked Internet Exposed devices. Right. Uh, this is actually more common than I like to say, but many times companies leave their PLCs or critical infrastructure on the internet, giving them a public IP address. Then using basically any available, uh, freely available tool that constantly scans the IP range, uh, it is possible to basically map these devices, and the attackers use this map to find all publicly accessible PLCs, uh, specifically Unitronics Vision Series. Mm -hmm. Now, this attack is very simplistic. All the attackers did was connect to the PLC and download new logic to the PLC, basically changing and altering the screen of the PLC, right. defacing it. But it does demonstrate they had access to the device and probably could have done a lot more. Yeah, exactly, because they don't need to actually do something behind the scene because that's very not cost effective because mm -hmm. then they need to understand each process and where this device sits in each process and it's very tedious very sophisticated instead yeah. they chose to simply deface it mm -hmm. and then they showcase hey we have access we hacked your device and they achieve the same result which is basically spreading fear and making the populace fear that they have access to this very very critical infrastructure right. And I remember when, like, the news stories broke about these attacks, they were calling them hacktivist attacks. I mean, it's not really who's behind it, but, I mean, like, to your point, you know, demonstrating access to something that's critical to a water facility does make people nervous. Yeah, exactly. This was, like, the main goal for this attack was spreading fear, propaganda, basically. Mm -hmm. However, the motivation was political. What in your opinion is kind of like the state of water facility cybersecurity in Israel, for example. Here in the United States, it's pretty well documented. These are largely small operations, not very well funded, not very well resourced. I mean, they're just trying to keep the water clean and running. I mean, 
is that comparable in, in Israel? So I think we do have uh, a bit more complex because yeah. we don't have that many water facilities. Right. At the end of the day, Israel is very small, uh, and of course, it's not as big. And also, because of at uh, previous targets and stuff like that, it was more uh, hardened. Sure. However, I mean, at the end of the day, the issues are the same. I mean, mm-hmm. If we see, uh, not, not specifically even in water facilities, but in critical infrastructure in general, if we see PLCs that are connected to the internet, I mean, it shows the general level of hygiene of the network is less protected. Right. Because this is like an extreme case mm-hmm. of, exp- of exposure. I mean, if we, I always tell people that the most important step in security is network hygiene. It's, you need to understand what's in your network, what's the attack surface in your network, and how can an attacker basically jump into your network. Right. However, if we're talking about internet exposed devices, I mean, that's, that's the obvious answer is it's not well protected. Yeah. So I- in this case, I mean, there was a, a severe lack of authentication capabilities on the PLC itself, but there's also some user error here in terms of, like, directly connecting these devices to the Internet, which yeah. is a, a no-no. <laughs> yeah, it's both. I mean, first of all, this, the Vision series is very, very old. It's an old series of PLCs, and because of that, yeah, the security mechanisms are also lacking. Now, yeah, the, the issue or the vulnerability that was exploited by the attackers was a lack of password on the PCOM protocol, which is the right. protocol used to control these PLCs. However, once again, th- while this is a major flaw, the, n- the other major flaw is that they were accessible in the first place. Right. Because from our knowledge, the uh, PLCs that were attacked were internet accessible and mapped on uh, IP s- scanners. Right. And I think in your talk, you had a slide that there's still about 900 of these exposed. Is that yeah, accurate? Yeah, that, that is accurate as far as like one or one and a half months ago when I made it slide. Uh, but yeah, that, that is accurate. Mm-hmm. And I, I think like every company should understand and query what they are exposing. Because right. I mean, in the case of PLC, it's obvious, but if we're talking about other devices, it could be an IoT device, it could be maybe an open port in the firewall that is forwarded ins- inside. I mean, every one of those could introduce risk to your network, mm-hmm. and I mean, it should be a consideration. So at the very least, the organization that has it should be aware of it and aware of the risk they introduce. And in terms of directly connecting to the internet, I mean, this is usually uh, a maintenance feature, right? Just a kind of a convenience? Yeah, exactly. I mean, when we're talking about why these companies connect them, their devices or the network to the internet, I mean, that's exactly the reason. I mean, at the end of the day, if we're talking about an ICS company that maybe has t- different sites in different physical location, whenever something goes wrong, whenever the device goes down, it is a problem and mm-hmm. it's, it might be very hard Right. send a person to each device and try and uh, investigate it in the field. Instead, their thought process is, hey, let's just give remote access to our devices. So if something goes wrong, we can patch it. Right. However, just opening a f- port in the firewall or basically giving it a public IP address is also super problematic. Mm-hmm. I believe companies should have a very good remote access uh, solution to enable them to connect to the remote sites because yeah I mean it's true you cannot rely on sending f- people to different physical locations this right. is also problematic right however you need to do it securely you cannot simply let anybody in and that's it you right. need to somehow have an infrastructure and a mechanism to secure your your access let's talk about the research uh, um, for a bit um, and we should mention that you you guys did find a vulnerability that it's been patched. Um, it's obviously on the users to, to update their, their devices, but there is a fix available. Um, just kind of explain the, maybe like the early days of the research, the motivation and how this all kicked off. Okay, so basically usually what we do in Team 82 is vulnerability research. We look at devices, try and identify cool vulnerabilities, report them to the vendor and help secure them. However, in this case, we we put on a different head, so to say. Instead of just looking for vulnerabilities on these devices, we realized that there is a need for forensic tools for this device. Because we had tons and tons and tons of different users were affected, and a lot of affected devices are sitting there. And we wanted to help and enable users 
who have affected devices to basically extract forensic evidence from their attack devices to know and better understand the attack and probably know who stood behind it. Sure. This was our goal. So our job was basically to develop this tool, which so far, uh, when we started looking at it, there was nothing available. You basically you had the basic understanding of the communication protocol, how to communicate with the device. However, there were almost no available clients, and of course, nothing that enables us to connect to the device and do some very major sophisticated operations. Mm -hmm. so our goal was to research this uh, communication protocol, the PCOM protocol, which is the protocol used by, used in, by Unitronics, understand it and somehow find how can we use it to maybe extract data from the PLC that could help us shed light about mm -hmm. the attack. So typically, if there's an attack against PLCs, where are you grabbing forensic information from? It's usually not directly from the device, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Because at the end of the day, if we're talking about PLC, I mean, it's an embedded device. It's right. not a Windows machine. You don't have like a GUI, desktop, no Windows event log, stuff right. like that. So usually in the past, if we're talking about the big OT attacks, like uh, Triton, like Stuxnet, not many forensic evidence was taken from the PLC itself, if any. Mm -hmm. Instead, they mostly relied on one of two things, either taking logs from some kind of Windows machine. For example, the Windows machine that attackers use to uh, connect and download logic to the PLC or from network logs, meaning, hey, this is our network. This is what happened. Let's analyze it. Yeah. However, this was not the case here because we have no Windows machine. I mean, the only two moving parts in this attack was were the PLC and the attacker's computer. And of course, because we're talking about tons and tons of different uh, companies, organizations, stuff like that, it's not like we can have good network logs yeah. uh, of every remote site. So the only thing we were left with is the actual PLC to extract evidence and data from. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was what we focused on. And were you sure that there were artifacts from the attacker's machine, for example, on the PLC? Or was it just kind of wishful thinking? <laughs> so it started with wishful thinking. Yeah. Because, you know, at the end of the day, because it's embedded device, we have no idea what's in there. I mean, at the end of the day, what's in there was decided by the vendor whenever they created it, like around the early 2000s. Sure. And it could have forensic evidence. It could have no forensic evidence. We had no idea. So we began with wishful thinking, saying, hey, let's try and see what we can extract from it. Right. Uh, and we can, I can tell you that in most cases, we would not be able to extract useful forensic evidence from mm -hmm. PLC devices because many vendors simply do not do it. Uh, I think it's problematic, the fact that you have no idea what your what logging mechanism your device have right. and what data can you extract from it. And I think in the case of an actual OT attack, we cannot only rely on IT logs. Right. We must have the tools, the tool set to be able to shed light on attacks yeah. only in the OT realm. And and that's just because some of this gear is old, right? I mean, is that largely the, the reason? Exactly. And, yeah. and I mean, we do see a lot of limitations. in yeah. this. Uh, I even in the forensic evidence that did, we did manage to extract, we do see limitations. I mean, w for example, the uh, project path, which is the path used for to save the project, is limited to 40 bytes. Now, of course, a path can be longer, but because it's an embedded device, because it's a legacy device, old device, the, the vendors and manufacturers chose, hey, let's limit it, and, uh, right. and that way we can save space. Mm -hmm. Everything is like, it started with a lot of wishful thinking, and uh, let's hope we can scrap something out. Right. But How often are you guys building custom tools, whether it's a forensics tool in this case or whatever, as, as you research anything? I mean, is this a common kind of part of your process so we did build a few open source tools yeah. in the past i mean for example the the thing that jumps to my mind is the opc ua exploitation framework yep. which is one of the biggest one uh, we also have an access tv parser uh, we have uh, some fuzzers uh, we have uh, anip uh, stack identifiers we have quite a few tool sets which we uh, open sourced inside mm -hmm. our github 
so it's not that far c- far fetched. Yeah. However, we usually don't do forensic efforts. Uh, this was we do do di- do it sometimes, but I mean, like I've told you, usually we put on the vulnerability research hat. Right. Uh, and that's why most of our tools in the past were exploit exploit focused or right. exploit centric. Uh, however, in regards to just building tools to use, like internally, or like building POCs, like all the time. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, if we find a vulnerability, this is probably because we tried and exploited and have some kind of POC for it. And how big of a roadblock is proprietary technology, like in this case, this PCOM uh, protocol? So, so that that's the main yeah. roadblock. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, uh, in order to communi- to know how to communicate with this device, you need to have very, very good understanding of this protocol. Now, this protocol is f- very complicated with many different uh, shenanigans, opcodes, stuff like that. And this is the roadblock. I mean, at the end of the day, this is the main issue in OT. You see, every right. vendor chose their own proprietary protocol. It's not like they've released an RFC release the documentation some did but most of it is still proprietary and is unknown and because of that in order to just put your hand your foot in the door you need to do a lot and a lot of research yeah. and so the protocol basically allows the the engineering workstation to communicate with the PLC is yeah. that yeah, the, 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 the protocol's main purpose is exactly that I yeah. mean, it connects to the PLC and sends its uh, operations for example hey please uh, read this memory address or write this memory address. Please uh, give me your identification, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And it is mainly uh, composed of requests sent from the uh, engineering workstation right. and responses sent from the PLC. So as we mentioned earlier, you guys released two uh, tools to open source today. Take me through each there because they're, they're both pretty different. Uh, functions at the end of the day. Yes. So the first tool we released is called uh, PCOM to TCP. Basically, it is a supportive tool uh, that helped us with our research. Uh, this tool is very simplistic. What it does is mainly encapsulates a PCOM message because PCOM is a protocol that supports either serial messages or TCP messages. Mm-hmm. So what this tool does is it takes a PCOM serial message and encapsulates it using the TCP layer. And that way you can transfer PCOM TCP to PCOM serial and vice versa. Okay. Now this tool help mainly helped us in our research in order to uh, ex- exactly do that, uh, exchange PCOM TCP and PCOM serial messages. The second tool, however, is basically, uh, it's called PCOM Client, and it is a full-pledged PCOM Client. Mm -hmm. What it does, it enables us to read and create uh, all the different kinds of PCOM messages. It could be PCOM Binary, which is one flavor of the protocol, or PCOM ASCII, which is another. And of course, it supports either TCP or serial. And not only that, but we added support for all the different opcodes or operations that we've researched and documented during our investigation on Unitronics. And so the second tool was really the crucial one towards extracting the forensic information you were looking for. Exactly. Or at least trying to. Yeah. The second tool enables users to connect to the devices and extract data yeah. from it. Is it worth talking about how, how it does that? I mean, and from a high level, I suppose. So from a high level... Basically, you need to spe- you need to specify what is the transport layer that you need to connect to the PLC, to your PLC. Meaning, are you connecting using serial or are you connecting using your IP? Mm-hmm. And after that, basically, you have a whole wide wide range of functions that enables you to create specific operations. So, for example, if you want to get the PLC's name, then you use this class that we've built, and you send a specific if we call a specific function that basically sends a request for the PLC to identify. And then our code takes this, re- this re- request, sends it over the line, of course it first constructs it, sure. and parses the struct that is returned in response, and of course returns the PLC name. Now, we, are, we basically implemented a wide range of these operations, which could be one simple function code like get ID, or mm-hmm. it could be a procedure which is composed of a few different function codes. 
Uh, and we build this inside our tool to enable you to create both the specific function codes, meaning the specific do that or do this, right. and the bigger operations behind it. Mm -hmm. And we should mention that you guys wrote a pretty extensive research blog about this, and we can link to it in the in the show notes, but people should definitely check it out because yeah, there's a sure. lot of much more in-depth than we're going to get into today. It basically goes over the research, the motivation, the process, basically everything that we've talked about yeah. and did in our Black Hat talk and in the research is composed into the blog. And basically, this is where we give the most extended like mm -hmm. look at this research. So w once you cut this tool loose and it started pulling in information, take me through that part of it and just kind of what you were able to, to learn and so, how useful it was. So, so our goal basically was to enable forensic extraction. Now, we can extract different forensic uh, evidence depending on the circumstance, meaning if we gain access to the project file, we can get access to a lot and a lot of data about the user who created this project file's computer. We're talking about paths, we're talking about keyboards that are installed on their computer, and we're talking about dates and events that happened in this computer. Mm -hmm. Now, in most cases, we won't get access to the actual project file, and instead we must rely on a structure that is called signature log that is located inside the PLC's memory. Now, in it, you can think about it almost like a signature log in a work place where you log in whenever you get in uh -huh. you sign hey I'm in this is the hour and this is what I'm doing so it's something similar like that that is stored on the PLC that basically stores all operations that were done to the PLC meaning someone connected to it someone downloaded new logic to it yeah. someone stopped it etc now from this log we can find tons and tons of evidence about once again, the user's PC, mm -hmm. including dates, including paths, usernames, you name it. And is it accurate to say that you couldn't get at the project file and that's kind of why you went after the signature log? Am I, did yeah. I understand that part of it correctly? Yeah, exactly. I mean, if we would, I mean, at the end of the day, we wanted to learn as much data information about the attackers. Now, in Unitronic specifically, whenever you download a project, you need to enable another thing to be able to perform an upload procedure. So if when I download the project into the PLC, I basically save my logic that I programmed into the PLC. And later on, if I want to upload this project from the PLC, which basically means to pull this data from the PLC to my computer, in Unitronics ecosystem, I need to be able to do something that's called burn. Right. Meaning I burn this project when I downloaded it, and this way I signal to the PLC, hey, I want you to be able to do upload in the future. Now, sadly, in this case, the attackers did not burn the PLC, that project, mm -hmm. meaning they did not enable us to, d to upload it later on, meaning they did not save the actual project file into the PLC's memory. This meant we could not get access to the attacker's project. However, in some cases, we were able to gain access to the old project of the previous users. Mm -hmm. Because of that, we moved on to the signature log, which basically enables us to get a lot of other forensic evidence. Uh, and this evidence could be used to better attribute sure. the attackers. So how do you know that, especially when you're dealing with an APT, for example, they'll spoof some of this information? Time of, you know, they'll change the timestamps or location, IP addresses, things like that. Um, I mean, basically you're collecting the information knowing that, right? Yeah. So, so we do see some stuff that was done by the APT, however, not uh, intentionally. Right. So at the end of the day, it's not like a protocol. Because it's embedded and, and not documented, it's harder for the APT as well to understand what kind of scratches, logs, stuff like that they are keeping inside the PLC. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even sure the APT knew about the signature log when they uh, yeah. uh, did this attack. So, for example, if we're talking about the username of the PC, we know that in the attack, the username that was used was administrator. Now, this is very general, not descriptive, sure. not pointing to anything. And this could be an effort into trying to basically make sure no one can learn who is, who, who is the actual attacker. Uh, and this is actually fairly simple. All you need to do is to create a computer and install a 
administrator as the username, not something descriptive. However, if we're talking about time zones, while it could be changed, uh, I mean, it, the attackers would usually not think that this would be saved somewhere because it's not as if like they are sending it over the wire knowingly yeah. instead it is taken from like during the download procedure which is a very long and hard to understand procedure right um so it must be exciting when you guys release something to open source because you never know like what the community is going to do with it right how do you, how would you hope people use it and you know, what kind of contributions would you love to see? Well, first of all, I hope people will use it to better understand their own infrastructure. So, sure. Yeah, I mean, if someone is affected by this attack or a similar attack, feel free to use our tool to be basically shed light on this attack and better understand what actually happened. Other than that, we are reaching out to researchers that either want to research Unitronix for various reasons. Feel free to use our tool. I mean, we help document and build a client which is super helpful yeah. in the research uh, in the process of researching something like this. Mm -hmm. However, not only that, but we would be happy if like researchers that have documented and researched other opcodes, other functionality of the PCOM protocol, feel free to add to our project and uh, contribute and we would be super happy to see it yeah. uh, and integrate it into this client. So cool. I mean, it's a big deal. I mean, like, you know, you control a PLC with malicious intent. A lot of bad stuff can happen. I mean, yeah. it's, um, just to wrap up, I know you're on a panel tomorrow. Tell me a little bit about what might happen there. <laughs> so we, we do the first Black Hat ICS Summit. Basically, yeah. we want to talk to the ICS folks uh, and and let let and see how they can, con can get in and contribute and get involved in the Black Hat experience. Uh, right. I think basically this is a shift towards trying to uh, better uh, improve and uh, uh, implement and basically combine the ICS community uh, into the Black Hat community. Yeah. yeah, there are a few talks this year, but it would be nice to see like a really robust track in the future. Exactly. Uh, I mean, th there is a track, the CPA, the, yeah. uh, the, the o OT track. Right. However, I mean, at the end of the day, Black Hat has in the past been more like not OT focused or maybe IT focused right. uh, and I think uh, it is it wants to shift more mm -hmm. uh, to be also put OT in the center that's a good thing <laughs> I, I believe so too alright man good to see you congratulations thank thanks you. again thank you Mike alrighty bye bye